Glad to see you here tonight, and uh, would, if you, if you would, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. You'll see on the handout we're going to be looking at verses 35 through 44. Just to kind of recap, and, and what, what we're looking at and what we're doing is uh, we're now at this part of Jesus' ministry where he's in his final week. This is the Passion Week. This is the Holy Week, as many times it's referred to. And he has, uh, by this time, had the triumphal entry. He has come in and uh, had the cleansing of the temple. Uh, this ruffled feathers, obviously. And people began to ask the questions about, uh, uh, by what authority are you doing this? And it goes from that into some questions that we looked at last week uh, and some that were pretty direct. Uh, also, uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight is going to be his observations after those questions. We dealt with the questions last week uh, about uh, uh, the Sadducees about resurrection. We talked about the, the first uh, commandment and then uh, uh, the one who asked him what's the greatest commandment and when he, respond, or when he responded, the scribe recognized it, affirmed him, and it was about the only positive question he received during that time. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Jesus' three observations, and they fall right on the heels of the questions, and in some respects, the very first observation he's going to make is going to be to turn now and ask them a question. They've been asking him questions, uh, trying to test him, now he's going to test them. And so uh, beginning there at verse 35, it says, Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? Now, that's kind of a loaded question because what he's saying is that uh, the Christ is the Messiah. So how can he be the son of David or best probably understood the descendant of David. It would sound like it would make him less than David. And so he's asking the question. He says, why is it that uh, the scribes say that the Messiah is going to be less than David when David himself, verse 36, said by the Holy Spirit, and he's now quoting from the Psalms, and he says, the Lord said to my Lord, and uh, this is uh, just so Psalm 101, 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then he asks it in this way. He says, now, if we're going to parse this verse, uh, look how J Jesus is referring to the Messiah. He says, the Lord, and if you'll notice in your Bible, and as, as it is in mine, uh, the Lord there is all capital letters. That's how it appears in the Old Testament which tells us that he's referring to Jehovah. The Lord God, Jehovah, said to, and David is talking, he said, he says to my Lord. So he's talking to somebody different. It's not the Lord talking to himself. He's saying the Lord Jehovah is speaking to my Lord, and that's who is the Messiah, the Christ. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's one of the things that would be true of the Messiah. And so Jesus is just asking the question. If David refers to the Messiah as his Lord, why are you saying that he's his descendant and less than David? David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And I love the way he makes the comment then after that. And the common people heard him gladly. They kind of said, yeah, that's right. You know, that makes sense. Stick it to him. <laughs> the deity of Christ is what this is all about. This first observation is Jesus making a very strong statement about the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, of the Messiah, and in, in, in this case, of who he is. The deity of Christ was always in question throughout his whole ministry. I put uh, about three verses in your, in your notes. Uh, I, I, I used to write out the verses in full uh, until it got to where it was too many pages to try to print off for each person, so I'm trying to condense it, so I'm giving you just the verses. I think on, on your handout you have just uh, 
the three verses, Mark 2, 7, John 10, 33, and Mark 14, 61 through 64. Well, I'm going to read those to you so that you'll know what you're looking at. And you can go back and study them two more if you'd like. But Mark 2, 7 says that uh, when they had the, the man who was healed dropped through the ceiling, the, 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 the paralyzed man, the man on the, brought in by four people, do you remember the story that the first thing he says to him was, your sins are forgiven you? And oh, that just got the hairs on the back of their neck standing up. They did not like that. And they asked the question in Mark 2, 7, why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And it wasn't saying that he couldn't forgive sins. They were saying he, he's not God. And his response was, to show you that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. I say to you, and he turned to the man on the, on the pallet, arise, take up your bed and walk. And the whole purpose of this demonstration and the purpose of this healing was to say to those who were in the house who didn't believe that Jesus was God, you're right, only God can forgive sins, but to show you I have the power to forgive sins, I also have the power to tell this man to rise, get up and walk. And that's what he did. In John chapter 10, there's an occasion on several occasions. The Jews wanted to take up stones and stone him. One time they wanted to throw him off the side of a cliff. They were always looking for ways to get rid of him. But in John chapter 10, verse 33, they were going to stone him. And so he asked them the question. He says, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, for what good work are you stoning me? What is the purpose of your stoning me? For what good work are you stoning me? And they responded to him saying, For good work we do not stone you. It's for blasphemy. Why? Because in his course of teaching, he had indicated that he was the Son of God, and that made him the Messiah, and that made him equal with God. And they recognized what he was saying. And they said, We are stoning you for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. Or say you're God. How many of you have ever heard people say, Jesus never claimed to be God? You ever heard that? I've heard that on several occasions. They say, if you go, go through and look through the scriptures, you will never find an instance where Jesus said he was God. Why do you say he's God? He never said he was God. And they are wrong. Absolutely wrong. If he never claimed to be God they wouldn't have had a case against him. Because in Mark chapter 14, when they had him on trial, here's what some of the false witnesses had to say about it. Again, the high priest asked him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. I am exactly who you think I am. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. I am equal with God. And he said, and furthermore, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and says, what further do we need, have need of for witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And what was the blasphemy? That he claimed to be God. The question of his deity had always been a part of their problem with him. And so in this final week of his life, there in the temple, he asks a Bible question to see if they could come understand why it was that David would recognize that the Son of Man would be greater than David. And they, will always say, they would always say, no, the Son of Man is less than David. He is David's son, David's descendant. They had a concept of the Messiah that Jesus just didn't fulfill, and it was a distorted concept. The Bible is absolutely clear. In fact, one of the classes that I took in Greek was simply to do a, 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 a class on verses to translate in, from Greek to English that proclaimed the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the most obvious ones that you probably are familiar with is John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Your neighbors who attend the Kingdom Hall 
will use their New World Translation and try to tell you, no, 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 no. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, little g. That's how their Bible actually translates it. And so they do not hold to the deity of Christ. This isn't, an old, this isn't an old concept that was only during the time of Jesus. Today, people have a hard time with Jesus being God. Why? Because then they have to listen to him. Then they have to bow to him. That every tongue will confess and, e or confess and every knee will bow that Jesus Christ is the Lord God, the Jehovah God. Colossians 2.9 explains, and we've looked at this verse before. When we looked at the triune Godhead and we talked about uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. This particular verse was one of the ones that we used because the objection to saying Jesus is God is because we, it describes what, what so many refer to as simply the doctrine of the Trinity. And they'll say, oh, no, the word Trinity doesn't appear in Scripture. You're mistaken. Well, they're right. The word Trinity doesn't appear, but the word Godhead does at least two times, three times if you have a King James. And the word Godhead is not talking about just divinity, that he is a God. It's talking about the Godhead, all that makes God God. All that makes God, the Father is the Godhead, the Son is the Godhead, and the Spirit is the Godhead. And Colossians 2.9 spells that out clearly. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I've made this indication for you before. God the Father is all the fullness of the Godhead invisible. God the Son is all the fullness of the Godhead visible. And God the Spirit is all the fullness of the Godhead that operates on man. Because what comes to live in your heart, and live in your soul, and, 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 and make you a new creation is not the incarnate person of Jesus Christ. It's the Spirit of God that dwells in you. But He's all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you. When Paul wrote for Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, this is a good verse to mark in your Bible. It's a good verse about the deity of Jesus Christ because it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, and received up in glory. And who do you think he's talking about? And the only one who fits that bill is Jesus Christ. And this scripture says that God was manifested in the flesh. That's what the prologue of, of the Gospel of John says. Uh, and the Word, the Logos, became flesh, dwelt among us. The deity of Jesus Christ may sound like an academic argument, but for a lot of people who have a hard time receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior is because they don't want to bow to somebody they think is just a man, somebody that's just a, a, a good man, a prophet. If you don't see Jesus as God, you don't come to him as God. If he is not God, then how do you think he took care of your sins? Because as Paul would write to the Corinthians, that we are the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The last verse you have on there is 1 John 5, verse 7. And I realize that some translations don't read as I'm about to read, but some of the most Reliable texts are clear. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. You can't get any clearer than that. So whether you're looking at John, whether you're looking at Paul, uh, whoever you're going to find that the, the New Testament teach, teaches beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. There's a few things, I'll, uh, there's a few things I, may, I may compromise over in terms of, of secondary things, as some people like to call them, when it comes to, 
to, to beliefs, but this ain't one of them. Don't mess with my Jesus. Jesus is stating in Mark 12 that he, the son, was David's Lord. And he was given a place of honor be beside Jehovah, making him more than just David's descendant, but the Messiah, the Christ, as well. The second observation is verses 38 through 40. Just three little verses. And this is actually the short version. <laughs> in fact, the very short version. He said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, gr love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. I call this the short version. Why? Because this is the shorter version of Jesus' comments that was recorded for us. The same comments were recorded for us in Matthew 23. I want you to turn to Matthew 23. You may want to put something in, in Mark 12 because we'll come back to it. But Matthew 23, I want you to see how long this went on. I don't want to call it a rant, but you've heard Jesus, you've heard the expression, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's Matthew 23. And it goes on for 36 verses. And as you look at it, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can look at it. He just starts out. He says, uh, uh, the scribes and Pharisees sit at Moses' seat. That, that, that means they should know better. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, well, you can listen to what they say. Just don't do what they do. And he'll point that out in just a moment. Uh, in fact, that's what he says in verse 3. Whatever they tell you to observe... That observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not. And then from there, he begins talking about them. And there's the, the, the woes. And they start there around verse 13. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Uh, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves or allow, or do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. This is part of what Mark was, was referring to. Therefore you will see the, receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You travel the land and see to win one proselyte. And when he's won, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Verse 23, you pay tithe and mint and anise to, and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law which are justice and mercy and faith. And he goes on and on. What do you, uh, verses 25, 27, 29, all of them all start with, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. In verse 33, he takes the gloves off. He calls them serpents, brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? And so Jesus is blaming the religious leaders uh, for teaching and not doing. And you remember when we talked about the, the, the uh, fig tree, the cursing of the fig tree, that part of that was talking about the fruitlessness of Israel? They're responsible for it. They were in the place where they could have been shedding the light, but instead they were making a pretense for religion. Uh, I've often said, when you find yourself... Cindy and I talk about this a lot, going to Mammoth Caves. Used to go down there. And how many of you have been to Mammoth Caves and been down to the uh, snowball room? You remember that, where they used to have the cafeteria? That was a long time ago. Well, if you ever go through the tour of Mammoth Caves, there's a point in which the guide will turn off the light. And boy, do you feel uncomfortable. I mean, you, you put your hand up. You can't even see your hand in front of your face. It is that dark. And some people get very anxious at times like that, and you can almost hear, uh, you can almost hear the sweat. But you can definitely hear somebody say, "Can you turn that light back on now?" <laughs> so I ask you the question, based on on that as an illustration: If two of you are walking in darkness, who's responsible for you walking in the darkness? It's the one with the light. And if the Pharisees and the scribes had the Word of God. Why were the people walking in darkness? 
You see, that's why he is so hard on them. It's because it's the ones with the light that should be showing the way instead of hiding the way. And so as a result, the sin of the scribes and the Pharisees was that they, they didn't practice. For one thing, they didn't practice what they preached, but more they kept the people from seeing the light of God. The light that was even in the Old Testament was to be extended all the way to the Gentiles. It never made it to the Gentiles. It didn't even make it to Israel most of the time. I put in there uh, four bullet points uh, of what was their sin. No, they didn't practice what they preached. I've already shared that, Matthew 23, 3. They practiced religion without compassion. Matthew 23, 14 says, You devour widows' houses, and in the same breath, for a pretense, you make long prayers. You, you're real good at looking religious. You're real good at looking the part but when it comes to the heart of compassion, you're empty. And as a result, he was, he was saying, this is why you deserve these comments. This is why the woes were given to him. They knew the letter of the law. They just disregarded the spirit of the law. He said in verse 23, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and, and you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, which are justice and mercy and faith. You're good at acting religious, and you got that part down, and, that, and, and you know that the term hypocrite means just to appear outwardly something that's not true of you inwardly. You've got the, you've got the mask. You've got it going. And as we saw a week or so ago, the Pharisees were even, to, to a great degree, respected by the people because they were middle class, and they were part of the crowd. They were part of the working class. And, and so they were, they were in the middle of the people. But they could not recognize when God was at work. And throughout the entire ministry of Jesus, they not only opposed him, they said he was doing what he was doing because of the work of the devil. Look what he says in verse 24. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow, I'm sorry, Matthew 12, 24, it's a different chapter. When they were talking about what Jesus was doing, the Pharisees said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. They couldn't recognize when God was at work, when Jesus was among them. And that's why Mark records at least a, a brief account of how he deals with those who just didn't accept him at all. Uh, it's true he was condemning their activities, and maybe it's worth mentioning, there were some good Pharisees. You knew that, didn't you? Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good Pharisee. He was an honest Pharisee. I guess you could say he was fair, you see. Finally got that one in. <laughs> because he went that night to talk to Jesus and he listened to Jesus, and every time you see him in the gospel after that, he's doing something to help Jesus. Even when he was crucified, it was Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, who, by the way, was also a Pharisee that came to claim the body and to bury it in Joseph's tomb. There were some good Pharisees. Probably the best one was Paul. You know Paul was a Pharisee, don't you? But something happens when you meet Jesus. Something happens when you see him for who he is, which is what he was trying to say in the first thing to the scribes. And when you see him for who he is, it changes what you are, not just what you've done. It changes what you are. And Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Paul, they all came to that point and they became different people. That's the second observation. Let's look at the third observation. Back to Mark 12 and uh, verse 41. And this is a story that you're very familiar with too. And, and by the way, most of the time these stories are kind of pulled out and handled by themselves. I put the three of them together because I found that they, they actually teach us something as a group. 
In the same, that we, same way we saw three warnings to Paul, in the same way that we saw uh, three misunderstandings uh, last Sunday, uh, we're going to see uh, uh, tonight three observations of Jesus that really will uh, kind of come together. This one, this third one I call is the, I call it the sacrifice of the humble. Because what she did, the widow, in the giving of her two mites, wasn't an offering. It was a sacrifice. And we, we need to understand the difference. Uh, Jesus sat opposite the treasury, verse 41, saw how the people put money into the treasury, how many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites. I'm sure I could have found out how much that was worth, but I didn't think that was as important as just knowing that it had nothing, had, had no comparison to the bags of money that other people were throwing in. But notice that he doesn't compare her offering to any individual. He compares her offering to everybody else. That's significant. This one poor woman, widow, came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. And so he called his disciples to himself, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. Not a one-to-one -one comparison. A one-to-everybody comparison. For they all put in out of their abundance. She, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. I think it's important for us to, to see that what she was doing was giving more than an offering. It was a sacrifice. And I don't mean she gave sacrificially. We use that term a lot. Now, uh, you probably have heard it before when it comes to providing a farmer's breakfast, the cow and the chicken make an offering. The pig gives a sacrifice because the pig can't feed the farmer without dying. What she did was to say, this is all I have and all I, all I know that I'm going to have, and I'm giving all that I am and have to God. That was a sacrifice. How her two mites are greater than bags of everyone else did? Well, I put down here, you, you, you know this, some could afford to give something. She gave all. Some decide they can't afford to give to God. That still goes on today. Some, de some decide, well, we've made out the, the budget, and, well, we just can't afford to give to God. I love what one of the families at Clifton said to me uh, when we began talking about giving. And she said, you know, we didn't used to tithe. And I got very convicted about it. And when I got convicted about it, uh, my husband and I talked about it, and we, we started doing it. And I'll tell you right now, Brother Randy, we can't afford not to tithe. We can't afford not to tithe. Because it's a spiritual issue. It's not a financial issue. And she had come to recognize that. So she had decided, this woman that she could not afford to not give to God. When Jesus saw this, he pointed it out as an observation of sacrifice, but also of humility. And this is a, what, one of the things we've been talking about a lot lately. He wasn't just praising the widow for giving her all. It was a matter of trusting God with her all. I put down here, and you can read, what was she going to do for her next meal? She was going to trust her God. You see, and, and we've been sharing this too in the past year. Uh, hopefully it's sinking in. God provides resources. Your work is a resource. Gifts are a resource. Uh, blessings from others are resources. God provides resources. But there's only one source, and that is God. And she had learned 
that God was her source. And so it wasn't finances that she was giving. It was her life, her livelihood, he says. She was demonstrating a total trust. When others gave out of their abundance, they could always rely on the rest being there when they needed it. But she was, she was demonstrating total trust. And that is how two mites is greater than bags of coins. Jesus wants us to know that one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses, uh, that our life does not consist in the abundance of things that we possess. And that's from the Gospel of Luke when he was giving a parable about covetousness of all things. So how do these three observations come together? I close out with just simply three statements. When you read these three stories together, your takeaway should be that Jesus is God. Let that burn in, in your mind, in your heart, and don't let anybody try to tell you differently. Jesus is God. You may think, well, that's a, that's a no-brainer. No, it's not a no-brainer. Not when people don't act like he's God. Not when people don't respond to him like he's God. Jesus is wanting them to know in this last week that he's there, I am God. And when he talked to about the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites, he says there, not just here, but in Matthew 23, it is, it is an observation. Some are going to deny that Jesus is God. Some are going to deny him. But then he gets encouraged. And he sees a humble poor widow woman give all of herself and all that she has. And when she gives all that she knows of herself to all that she knows about God, he says, this woman has given more than everybody else put together who has contributed to the functioning of this temple. Some give all of themselves to God and they will be recognized by Jesus. I think that's what the story tells us. Standing, sitting there watching of all the people to recognize. To recognize the one that gave all that they are and all that they have to God. So, we just want to take these observations and, and apply them where they need to be applied.